Number 5. Nephilim. This one I can get behind for sure. How the pyramids were built still baffles me, and reading all about these things at least makes my brain relax for a second. The giants. The talls, the long neck people, the Nephilim. Again, never been a Bible guy myself, so no judgment if you say all this happened, but I'm just catching up on all this stuff. But in short, the Nephilim were like the offspring of angels and human women, according to Genesis 6, 1, 4, and Jude. The Nephilim are also mentioned in Numbers 13, 33, but it is likely that by this time in Israel's history, Nephilim was used as a term for a tall, intimidating peoples. It's plausible that the Nephilim were both half angels and half giants, making them absolutely huge and absolutely super strong. The Nephilim were the children of the sons of gods and daughters of men. And Christian scholars have theorized that the sons of gods were actually these demonic fallen angels who reproduced with women. Being the offspring of partial angelic heredity, the Nephilim were considered mighty men who are of old the men of renown. The ancients. These people were huge, claiming that they were like five times the size of an average man. In the Hebrew Bible, a group of mysterious beings or people of unusually large size and length who lived both before and after the flood were called Nephilimus, sometimes translated to giants. Even the fallen ones from the Hebrew Nephil, meaning to fall. Seems like these people were writing about similar stuff, huh? Spooky. Number four, 200 million horsemen. This next one is not really a creature as much as it's the end of a lot of all of us. All this Armageddon stuff they were saying, that's some pretty strange stuff that's on its way. Book of Revelation stuff, you know? Quote, I saw as God wanted to show me the horses and the men on them. The men had pieces of iron on their chests. These were red like fire and blue like the sky and yellow like sulfur. The heads of the horses looked like the heads of lions. Fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. One third part of all man was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur that came out of their mouths. Word for word, horsemen or ancient biblical technology? This sounds horrifying. Also, 200 million? That's a lot of flying flaming horses just trucking around the skies and sands like giant tanks firing fire fire out of their mouths and nose. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and a great cloud with brightness around it, and fire flashing forth continually, and in the midst of the fire, as it were gleaming metal. And from the midst of all this came likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had a human likeness. Hmm. Okay. You put a Baja hoodie on me at a Dave Matthews concert and hear me saying all that stuff, you probably just think I'm some sci-fi stoner. Nope. This is riveting material, folks. I need to read this thing front to back. Apparently, this force was supposed to have taken out or is going to take out a third of the entire world's population. I know like three things that can do that. Pandemics, missiles, and floods. However, if men and horses showed up with lion heads breathing fire, it's safe to say it's game over. Number three, unicorns. Hold up. This is scarier than the devil, right? Unicorns, really? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, not the glittery ones with Farrah Fawcett hair like Hercules rides. More like a firstborn bull, giant, with a huge spear on its head. He has majesty, and his horns are the horns of a wild ox. And with them, he shall gore the peoples, all of them, to the ends of the earth. Okay, yeah, that's really aggressive. I guess unicorns were a little bit scarier in the Bible, huh? Couple times these things are brought up too. It seems like a lot of people were seeing these. Yeah, I'd say a hunk in a suit on a television series is much less scary than a monster horse goring you to death. A ram is mentioned nine times in the Hebrew Bible. It's been translated to unicorn in the King James Version, and some translations as oryx, which was seen as a wild ox or rhinoceros. Quote, and the unicorn shall come down with them, and the bullocks with the bulls and their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust made fat with fatness. Uh, yeah. Harsh. I mean, rhinos and other single-horned animals do do this. The Bible describes unicorns skipping like calves, traveling like bulls, and bleeding when they die. So they were real and very mortal, mostly believed to be an exaggeration though. Even Julius Caesar speaks of them. Quote, a little below the elephant in size and appearance, color, and shape of a bull, their strength and speed are extraordinary. They spare neither man nor wild beast. Were the ancients seeing like giant extinct rhinos? Or were these flying evil narwhals just goring everyone to the end of the earth? Who knows? Sure sounds like it. Number two, locusts. Dude, I'm already afraid of the 12 inch flying praying mantises that do exist today. I can't imagine what these things looked like. Imagine a dog sized flying insect blocking out the sun because there's so many of them. 
Abaddon's locusts. These things were terrifying. The Bible has this to say about them. The fifth angel, apparently Abaddon, sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by smoke from the abyss, and out of the smoke, locusts came down upon the earth and were given power like that of scorpions. These demon bugs are well detailed in the Bible. They're described as, quote, horse-like creatures preparing for battle, adorned with crowns of gold above their head. Their face is like a man, but woman's hair with lion's teeth. Their body was locust-like, covered with iron breastplates. They have scorpion-like stings on their tails and razor-sharp claws, and the sound of their army will be like a million horses marching to the battlefield. Dude, that's a locust? Like a locust, the bug? No, 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 I don't think so. They will be freed by their master Abaddon from the bottomless pit and will torment all of the remaining sinners on earth for five months. Abaddon is described as the king of the army of locusts. Yeah, guy's really into bugs. Yeah, that's like some fear factor stuff right there. Just like a million bugs swarming you? No, no thanks. And coming in at number one, the dragon. Okay, there's some speculation here that this thing is the devil himself. The devil and the dragon. But also this thing apparently lives with the devil. I don't know, people were saying mixed things, but important thing is things weren't too literal back then and they were really spiritual. People were just trying to explain what they were seeing and feeling the best way they could. But yes, there was dragons. Yeah, we have the skeleton bones. Okay? And before you're picturing something fun like Dudley the Dragon or the ones that talk in The Hobbit who sit atop gold, no, no, no. Picture when it sneezes, it flashes light. Its eyes are like the red of dawn. Lightning leaps from its mouth. Flames of fire flash out. Smoke streams from its nostrils like steam from a pot heated over burning rushes. Its breath would kindle coals for flames shoot from its mouth. Yeah, this thing. Terrifying. Tremendous strength of Leviathan's neck strikes terror wherever it goes. Its flesh is hard and firm and cannot be penetrated. Job 41, 18, 23. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world was thrown down to the earth with all the angels. And I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs leap from its mouth of the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. They are demonic spirits who work miracles and go out to the rulers of the world to gather them for battle against the Lord on that great judgment day of God the Almighty. He seized the dragon, that old serpent who is the devil, Satan, and bound him in chains for thousands years. The angel threw him into the bottomless pit, which he then shut and locked so Satan could not deceive the nations anymore until a thousand years were finished. Okay, yeah, that sounds like one giant amazing cutscene from a God of War game. Just chucking a dragon into a pit? Also, it's 2022. We better lock that thing back up. It's been more than a thousand years now, no? Quote, And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. Okay, so it wears seven crowns. Maybe this thing is the devil. It's mentioned numerous times in the Bible. I've seen Game of Thrones. This thing is scary. Yeah. Coming in at number five, Mammon. Mammon, also known as Maimon or Plutus, is a powerful fallen angel. Mammon, now a demon, is commonly personified as greed itself. He is the noble demon lord of abundance, prosperity, wealth, and injustice. He also is most often personified as a deity. In his appearance, Mammon is somewhat similar to the gods Plutus and Dispater, especially when Plutus appears in the Divine Comedy as a wolf like demon of wealth, wolves being associated with greed in the Middle Ages. Thomas Aquinas metaphorically described the sin of greed as Mammon being carried up from hell by a wolf, coming to inflame the human heart with greed. During his time in heaven, he was depicted as forever looking downward at heaven's golden pavement rather than God himself. In fact, Mammon's obsession with gold was to the point where he did not even care about Lucifer's rebellion. But due to the fact that he cared more about material wealth than God, he was cast out by the archangel Gabriel. After the rebellion in heaven, Mammon was banished to hell, where he is the one who finds underground precious metal that his demonic companions used to build their capital city, Pandemonium. He did this by Lucifer's order. Mammon cancels the devils to be happy with what they have got and to create a home for themselves in hell. At some point in time, with the aid of Mulsabet, Mammon created the legendary Twin Blade, which was made from the bones of a fallen angel, salt that was crystallized from the tears of Michael, then melted down with the ichor of a god into Damascus steel. The Twin Blade is capable of killing almost anything. In at number four, we have Asmodeus. Asmodeus is a king of demons and earthly spirits. 
mostly known from the Book of Tobit. The demon is also mentioned in some Talmudic legends, for instance in the story of the construction of the Temple of Solomon. He was thought to be the king of the Nine Hells by some Renaissance Christians. He also represents one of the seven deadly sins, lust. Being the demon of lust, he is responsible for twisting people's sexual desires. It is said that people who fought Asmodeus' ways will be sentenced to an eternity in the second level of hell. He is also a demon of literary jealousy, anger and revenge. Asmodeus is either a ruthless, brutal monster and mischievous demon endowed with a playful and satirical genius. Asmodeus was originally an angel known as Asmodal and was in the order of Cherubim. Right before the war in heaven, he joined Lucifer's rebellion against the Lord only to be personally defeated by the archangel Raphael. But not before Raphael brutally tore out the lion part of his body and cast him out of heaven with the rebel angels in tow. Asmodeus barely survived the fall due to the injuries inflicted on him by Raphael, but he managed to recover. The lion that was originally part of him, now torn, became something of a pet and steed. He also became one of the seven kings of hell, embodying the sin of lust. He has hundreds of legions of demons under his command. He incites gambling and is the overseer of all the gambling houses in the court of hell. Asmodeus also became the husband of Lilith, though she does not exactly find his presence to be welcoming or tolerable at all. Number three, the Leviathan. Okay, at first I was like, oh, that's a roller coaster at Canada's Wonderland. No, 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 this vicious monster was actually modeled after this vicious monster. The Leviathan, the second of the great monsters described in the book of Job. This Leviathan, Leviathan, is an absolute massive sea monster who's impervious to human weapons, breathes fire, and emits smoke from his nostrils. Uh, yeah, so this is a Zelda boss, for sure. The Leviathan is probably related to another ancient monster called Lotan, a seven-headed giant serpent who represents primeval chaos, as with pretty much every other biblical creature does. Hey, these things aren't meant to be cute and fuzzy. There's some less exciting theories that insist the Leviathan is just a dramatic interpretation of a crocodile or anaconda or maybe a plesiosaur resembling something like the Loch Ness Monster. But that doesn't explain the breathing fire thing or the size. Was this giant sea snake a water dragon? Because apparently it's like 300 miles long. Yeah, terrifying. Scary thing now is many different religions and cultures have their own version of the Leviathan. Tiamat, Hydra, Jormungandr. Maybe this thing was just hunted into extinction. I don't know. What do you think? Number two, Archangel Michael. It is said that the angels are not humans, but creatures made from God's creation. I've also seen what the Bible describes angels looking like, and it's not handsome people with wings. Apparently a lot of these things, people really couldn't even describe what they were seeing in front of them. But we'll get to what these things look like in a minute. Of those creatures, Satan, AKA Lucifer, is one, the one. However, here is even one creature that Satan fears more than any creature, and that's fellow Archangel Michael or Saint Michael. Some say they're brothers, some say they were on the same team for a bit. This is some good stuff, people. Quote, now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven, and the great dragon was thrown down that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Revelation 12, 7, 9. Okay, so hold on. He and them are all down here with us? That's terrifying. Apparently Michael led that army, that one, so whatever scares Satan, scares the hell out of me as well. Also, all these pictures and statues of him and like window panes are all of him like wielding a giant sword made of light, just stepping on Satan's back as a hero. That's pretty intimidating, not gonna lie. And coming in at the number one spot, Ophanim. Okay, so what angels actually looked like? Apparently it was like giant geometrical feathers with eyes and a consciousness. Some had horns, some had hooves, lots of gold and metal colors. This next thing doesn't even make sense to my brain. I feel like this is an ant hill trying to understand an iPhone. Quote, as I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature with its four faces. This was the appearance and structure of the wheels. They sparked like topaz and all four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel, intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in any one of the four directions the creatures were faced. The wheels did not change direction as the creatures went. Their rims were high and awesome, and all four rims were full of eyes all around. Ezekiel 1, 15, 18. Uh, first off, is this thing even a creature? Yeah, everything I see here is an alien. Is this just us trying to process some sort of like energy being with eyes? Because if I saw Lucifer that looks like the hunk on the Netflix show, and then I saw this thing? 
One of the Dead Sea Scrolls interprets them as angels. Late sections of the Book of Enoch interprets them as class of celestial beings who don't sleep and guard the throne of God. Whatever these thing or things are, it sounds and looks absolutely horrifying. How could you paint that on a ceiling? I would just give up and paint wings and a halo as well. For real though, like that is a spaceship of some sort, isn't it? I mean, I understand the times, maybe the science wasn't there, but this thing is straight out of a sci-fi novel. Number five, Abessa Thibu. Coming up first on our list of angels who are anything but angelic is Abessa Thibu, who would frequently correct the other angels on how his name was pronounced. He's a fairly obscure angel, but an incredibly powerful one of lore. Abessa Thibu introduces himself as a hostile threat to God, and would end up becoming a demon dueling with Moses, and fancies himself a nemesis to the kingdom of heaven. That's a lofty ambition. Abessa Thibu lived in heaven alongside the other angels and God whom he served under. When Beelzebub left heaven, he took some buddies with him, and among them was our good friend Abe the Unpronounceable here. Beelzebub would explain to Solomon that during this fall, he took Abessa Thibu with him, who became a demon of the earth. In his newfound demon form, Abessa Thibu has one giant red wing, which took on a twisted mutated form after he fell. As he was falling from the heavens, the ever angels were all like, oh no, not Abessa Thibu, we love that guy! And they tried to grab him to save him. But unfortunately, it failed and his wings were torn off. And the little stump wing that remained mutated and twisted into a swollen, monstrous dark red wing, which would probably be terrible. But if you're like an edgy fallen angel, that's probably just perfect for your your aesthetic. He probably looks so cool. This demon saw himself not just as an enemy of God, but also to Moses, determining to make Moses' life just terrible. In the Testament of Solomon, he claims he was the source of all turmoil that Moses had encountered, confessing that he hardened the Pharaoh's heart against Moses, leading to the Exodus. When Moses led the Israelites across parted waters, the demon followed. When the Red Sea closed on the Pharaoh's army, Abednego's Hebrew found himself trapped in a pillar of air, trapping him inside, condemning him to support the pillar until the end of time. If you're looking for more scary stories about demons, angels, aliens, spaceships, monsters, cryptids, ghosts, goblins, and just about everything scary under the sun and above it, stay subscribed to Top 5 Scary and don't miss a minute. Number 4, Samael. As far as bad angels go, Samael is probably beat out only by the angels from Neon Genesis Evangelion for destruction. He's sometimes called the Angel of Death, which is how you know he's kind of bad news, and his name literally translates to Venom of God. You don't get to wave titles like that around without being pretty lethal to back it all up. Kind of like Azrael, Samael is fiercely loyal to God without question. Whatever God wants Samael to do, he'll do it. Good, evil, none of those things mean anything to him. He doesn't make choices or render judgment, he kind of just follows orders. If God told him to eat a can of worms, he'd do it. On the hour of a man's death, it's said that Samael will make himself known to you. He'll appear before you with his blade drawn, soaked in poison, God's venom. This poison is what truly severs a man's soul from this mortal coil, withering and rotting them as you get a taste for it. It's thought that this is where the term to taste death comes from. Samael is also known as the accuser, the seducer, and a midnight joker. He accused the Israelites of idolatry and condemned them all to an early death when they fled with Moses. He seduces humans into acts of evil and well, I know this is making him sound like he's a really evil guy and he's doing evil acts and sure he does rub elbows with equal number of angels and demons, but he's just doing what he's paid to. Samael is God's will, but he's also kind of like God's mercenary, you know? He just does whatever he's asked. And he tries to test humanity and draw out their sinful and unrepentant ways so God can judge them properly. And those who fail will get another visit from Samael. He's not such an evil guy, he just flicks the switch. He's got a little bit of a friendly, brotherly rivalry with the Archangel Michael. Michael's role as an angel is to protect humanity, and Samael's is to vilify it. Michael defended the Israelites when Samael was accusing them, and Michael replaced Isaac with a ram so that Abraham wouldn't sacrifice him. They both want the same thing, you know, they just want to make God happy, they just go about it in slightly different ways. In at number 3 we have Belphegor. Belphegor is a fallen angel, now a demon lord that presides over the sin of sloth, and is one of the seven princes of hell that rules hell. Belphegor gives people people ideas for inventions that will make them rich, which leads them to be greedy and selfish. Belphegor is a lieutenant from hell, who had been dispatched to earth on a mission by Satan. As one of the fallen angels, Belphegor was originally a member of the Order of Principalities, and after his fall he became a demonic counterpart to one of the ten Sephiroth that oversees the Tree of Life. During his time in heaven, Belphegor was a friend of his model and 
Maman, but he did not exactly enjoy his angelic duties, foreshadowing his slothful tendencies. Moreover, Belfagor enjoyed crafting strange and intricate objects from all manner of material he could find, which according to him was his outside hobby. Unlike the majority of rebel angels, Belfagor did not join Lucifer's side after he declared the war against heaven, nor was he at God's side either. Despite not being part of Lucifer's rebellion, the fact that he did not join God's side earned him his father's punishment of being cast down to hell alongside other rebel angels. No longer an angel of God, but an archdemon of sloth. Belphegor, along with Asmodeus and Mammon, was soon awakened by the sound of Lucifer's voice calling out to him from newly created hell as a result of his impact from the fall. Belphegor took part in the construction of Pandemonium, given his talent and interest in machinery. He participated by crafting the inner workings of the capital, whilst Mulciber and Mammon worked on both the exterior and interior. He was then present at the Pandemonium during Lucifer's rally. Belphegor had then become one of the seven kings of hell. Belphegor is invoked by mortals who wish to find fame and wealth through invention, often with as little effort as possible. These wishes, as with almost any demonic invocation, are doomed to fail, because Belphegor's true mission is to draw the lazy into the sin of sloth. Through the failure of whatever Belphegor provided to the invoker, he draws them into procrastination and idle dreaming rather than producing, thus damning them. So maybe you're not lazy, you're just damned by Belphegor. Coming in at number 2 we have Malok. Malok was once an angel serving God. Due to his own self interest, he was cast out. He gained a cult following and many worshipped and followed him in ancient times. Child sacrifice is non existent today, hopefully, but that hasn't always been the case. In ancient times, it was commonly associated with people hoping for greater fertility, free the person or a land. But one cult stands out from the rest the cult of Malak, the Canaanite god of child sacrifice. In the bowels of a big bronze statue with the body of a man and the head of a bull, offerings, at least according to the Hebrew Bible, were to be reaped through either fire or war. It is said that devotees can still be found today. People prayed and offered to Malak as they believed he was responsible for the weather and fertile agriculture. If they wanted their land and people to thrive, they believed that they must make this sacrifice for the gods or specifically Malak to bless them. Though the biblical account describes children being passed through the fire to Malak, Hebrew prophets are universal in their condemnation of the practice. This has suggested that such sacrifices might have been made to the Abrahamic god by some cult, but were condemned and cast out of the orthodox faith as a thema. Followers argued that this was not a practice of God, but those who were led astray. Others claim that Malak was an angel before he fell, and those who followed him mistook his word for religion. There are religious sacrifices sites still standing around the world today, preserved in time as a reminder of the dark history of following false gods. Although it was more commonplace in ancient culture, there are modern cases of Malak worship. Obviously, these are kept more personal, as this would not be accepted. There have been claims that some influential people in today's society secretly make sacrifices to Malak to gain power and influence over today's world. Of course, we do not have evidence of this, just claims. Do you believe that people are committing such horrible acts for their own self interest? And finally, in at number one, we have Lucifer. Lucifer, also known as Satan, the devil, light bringer, the light bearer, and the morning star, was one of the earliest of God's creations. Also, the twin brother of Michael. He was regarded as the wisest, greatest, and most beautiful angel in all of creation, having virtually no equal, with only God being his superior. He is infamously known as the angel that rebelled against God and heaven and caused the downfall of mankind. Lucifer was said to be the brightest in all of creation and was the most revered too, and most praised among the angels for his beauty and power. This in the process caused Lucifer to be prideful of himself. So immense was his grace and power that his throne was positioned atop a mountain anointed by God himself, adorned with burning stones known only as the stones of fire, infused with the fires of the sun to give light to the dead and the lost as Lucifer guided them to paradise. It was not until God created humans that Lucifer's pride began to overtake him and grew more rebellious against his father. It soon led to Lucifer becoming dissatisfied with following God alongside the fact that his father favoured the new creations known as humans, spending less time with his own family and more on developing those humans. To add insult to injury, Lucifer would be told by God to watch over and guide these humans, which only made Lucifer look down on these mortals with contempt, especially when having a perfect being like him watching over these creatures like a shepherd over his flock. However, he saw that the humans would be no different than everything else that would be under God's puppet strings and realised that he could perhaps impart his ideas of existentialism on these new creations. He approached one of the two, named Lilith, who was strolling through the primeval plains of the Garden of Eden, and the two had a rather amicable conversation. During the conversation, Lucifer managed to persuade Lilith into siding with him as well. He convinced her that since Lilith had been created from clay, the same as Adam, she is equal to him, and therefore should not be under him. She would be no puppet bound to any string, and would instead live out her life the way she desires to live it, rather than having been told how and why. Lilith was enlightened by the morning star's words 
words and this caused her not to be submissive to Adam and leave him. Being the second born creation of God Lucifer is a being of incalculable celestial power. He is among the most powerful entities in all of creation, the only two beings that somewhat rival him. In the depths of hell are Satan and Beelzebub. After being released onto earth, Lucifer's mere presence upon breaking through was said to have shook the globe and created several unnatural disasters around certain parts of the world. Moreover, his presence also caused supernatural beings and psychics immense agony and trembled from sheer dread. I don't think you need to tell me that Lucifer should definitely be feared and deserves the top place on this list. Starting off this countdown, we have the cherubs. Cherubs are the angels that were assigned to guard the Garden of Eden. Modern day depictions of them have them looking like plump naked toddlers, sometimes with bows and arrows. But guess what? The cherubim that is mentioned in the Bible are a little different than that. In fact, they are terrifying looking. They are described as so, and I quote, In appearance, their form was human, but each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, their feet were like those of a calf. Each had the face of a human being, and on the right side, each had the face of a lion, and on the left, the face of an ox. Each also had the face of an eagle. Yeah, you heard me. So they have four faces, a human one, a face of a lion, a face of an ox, and a face of an eagle. I'm sorry, but that just makes me very uncomfortable. Continuing on, it says, and I quote, they each had two wings spreading upward and each had two other wings covering its body. The appearance of the living creatures were like burning coals of fire or like torches. So not only did they have four faces, but they had four wings as well. So they're just a weird human animal hybrid that's also on fire. Can't forget the fire part, but wait, it gets worse. In Ezekiel 10.8, it claims that their backs, hands, wings, and their whole body were covered in eyes. That concerns me. Why do they need that many eyes? Like imagining summoning that thing. Its appearance alone would scare the crap out of you. In our fourth spot, we have Azrael. Azrael is also known as the Angel of Destruction, which if you ask me, is kind of like an oxymoron. Like angels are supposed to fix things, not destroy them. Although he's described as being a being of light, this guy has a dark side. First off, let's talk about his appearance. In one description, he is said to have four faces, 4,000 wings, and 70,000 feet. What's the purpose of that? Why does he need that many appendages? But wait, there's more. Apparently, his body is covered in eyes and tongues. Each set corresponds to the number of men inhabiting the Earth. And I mean, there are billions of men on Earth. So this guy has billions of eyes and tongues all over his body. You know, I'm not one to judge a book by its cover, but that is absolutely terrifying, and I wouldn't ever want to meet this dude. Even if he was super sweet and gave me ice cream and candy. No, just no. Not only that, but it's believed that he is massive. In one text, it says that his body stretches across multiple levels of heaven. So, a massive angel with billions of eyes and tongues all over his body and thousands of feet. Yeah, do not summon him. So, of course, different texts have different stories about him. For example, sometimes he's referred to as the angel of death, and he transports the souls of the dead after their passing. In the book of 2 Samuel, though, he slaves 70,000 sinners and nearly wipes out Jerusalem with a plague. There's more to the story, but it just shows you how powerful he is and the chaos he can cause. Number three is going to be Abaddon, one of many angels who was tasked with doling out divine judgment to humanity. He was sent by God to torture the earth and humanity as punishment for all of their sins. Ugh. Interestingly, in some truly ancient Gnostic texts, Abaddon actually helped out pitching in creating humanity. Oh. Thanks, man. It's said that he gathered handfuls of dirt from the earth for which God could craft Adam with. I did not know he was made out of dirt. Anyway, Abaddon helped start everything, so I guess it only seems fair and fitting that one day he's allowed to end everything. It's said during Judgment Day, Abaddon will gather the souls of the damned and carry them down to the place of God's final judgment. Jeez, with guys like these, what do we even need Satan for? His name, Abaddon, literally translates to the destroyer or the destruction, which is why he might actually be the real angel of death. I'm so sorry, Samael. I know you really wanted it, but Abaddon just worked like a little bit harder for it. There's a little bit of theological confusion when it comes to Abaddon as depending on the source text, occasionally he's not an angel at all. 
but a subordinate of Satan, leading a pack of demons instead of anything divine. Even more interestingly than that though, is that sometimes he's not even a living being. Sometimes he's straight up a place. In some Jewish and Christian texts, he's listed as a hellish abyss thought to be another realm of the afterlife. For example, Job 31.12 refers to a fire that consumes to Abaddon. Some believe that Abaddon is both an entity and this bottomless pit afterlife realm that he can manifest himself as both. Or maybe Abaddon was just a really common name back then, you know? Maybe there was a ton of Abaddons running around. Number 2. Azrael Azrael is a lesser known angel in Christian and Judaistic texts. He's an archangel of heaven, like Gabriel or Samael, but he commands frightening power as he is the angel of destruction. He was commanded by God himself to eradicate and renew life. He's an angel, sure, but he's kind of one of the scarier angels out there. He carries out the will of God no matter what that may entail. If he has to collect the souls of the dead or melt sinners with punishment, Azrael is totally game for it. Unlike some of these other fake angels, Azrael is always loyal to God above no matter how heavy the task. You probably know that the cherubic depiction of angels that like greeting cards and cartoons use is a bit of a pop culture cleanup and that biblically accurate angels are terrifying. I mean there's a the reason the first thing angels are always saying in biblical texts is be not afraid. Maybe you've seen some of those biblically accurate angel memes, those are all gold. Well, Azrael is no different. There's no one definition of Azrael's form, but he doesn't always just look like a handsome human boy with wings. He usually is said to have four faces and a body covered in an infinite amount of fractally expanding eyes and tongues. And these eyes and tongues are supposed to represent the souls of man on earth. We all correlate. We all have an eye and a tongue on Azrael's big body somewhere. In Islamic texts, Azrael is is said to have 70,000 feet and 4,000 wings and I, I guess just like two hands. Azrael across all texts is omnipotently powerful on a near cosmic scale. He's said to keep track of every single soul on earth and is responsible for all of them. In the Old Testament, King David committed adultery with a woman named Bathsheba and when he confesses his sins to God, God rules the king can choose what punishment shall befall him. Well King David was a little shy so he lets God pick anyway and God chooses one of his old classics, Plague, and Azrael happy to carry out the will of God, spreads a plague across Jerusalem, ending the lives of some 70,000 men. Well, if that's the case, at least he'll be losing some of those ever-expanding eyes and mouths, right? Probably fill up some space on the canvas? That's not so bad. And finally, number one, Michael. In a modern context, I think there's something funny about putting the, the ultimate, scariest, most powerful angel out there is a being named Michael. Just knowing that God's most fearsome, loyal warrior could potentially go by Mikey kind of takes something away from him. Now, while most most of the angels on this list kind of have like a dubious morally gray reputation and sometimes get themselves involved on some very nasty business on God's behalf. Michael is the hero archangel. Michael is commonly depicted as a radiant, shining soldier wearing gold armor. He's beautiful, handsome, brave, and he carries with him a powerful sword and shield for which he can carry out God's will and protect man with. When you close your eyes and you kind of think of like a divine warrior, you're picturing Michael without you even knowing it. Michael is a legendary warrior in heaven's army and he goes toe to toe with Satan in combat. For the control of Moses' soul, most famously, Satan declared that Moses' soul was his for the taking and since Moses had taken life before the exodus, Satan thought he had a claim on this. But Moses was a servant of the Lord so this wasn't going to work out. Michael flew down from up above to lay a celestial beat down on the prince of darkness. Michael is almost like an angelic superhero, a, a light in the darkness, someone who swoops in to defend humanity from the legions of the world and the corruption of the dam. He's kind of like a total Boy Scout. He's also not just any old archangel, he's THE archangel. The Greek etymology for archangel means chief angel, implying that Mikey here isn't just a really good angel, but like the captain of the angels, implying that there are no true peers on his level of devotion. During Judgment Day, when it's said a war of angels and demons will be carried out, Michael will be the commander leading the armies of heaven on the ground against the forces of evil. In the old scriptures, Michael only says one thing and it's kind of like an action movie one-liner while he fighting Satan. With sword drawn, Michael boasts, the Lord rebuke you. Simple, to the point, very cool. Starting with number five, we have Behemoth. No, 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 not the ride of Canada's Wonderland. I'm talking about the mythological beast that dates back to the beginning of mankind and whose name is now an adjective for any large or powerful being. The name Behemoth originated historically from the archaic Jewish name for hippopotamus and is described as a beast from the biblical book of Job. He is a form of the primeval chaos monster created by God at the beginning of creation, being paired up with the other chaos monster, Leviathan. And according to later Jewish tradition, both would 
become food for the righteous at the end time. Hey, uh, if I wind up qualifying as righteous, can I have a funnel cake instead? Once again, not any kind of reference to the theme park. These beings came first, but now I'm kinda in the mood to tackle a roller coaster. Well, I've established that Behemoth was a brutish beast known for incredible strength, legend says he was originally created to help stabilize the world and is known to create chaos in humans' lives, just like my roommate. He is said to take the form of a colossally large elephant with pitch black eyes covered in white scales that appear to be falling off and has teeth the size of Mount Everest. Uh, yeah, that's a little too big for my liking. The direct quote from the Book of Job that I mentioned earlier is as follows. 15 behold behemoth, which I made as I made you, he eats grass like an ox. 16 behold his strength in his loins and his power in the muscles of his belly. 17 he makes his tail stiff like a cedar, the sinews of his thighs are it together. 18. His bones are tubes of bronze, his limbs like bars of iron. 19. He is the first of the works of God. Let him who made him bring near his sword. 20. For the mountains yield food for him where all the wild beasts play. 21. Under the lotus plants he lies, in the shelter of the reeds and in the marsh. 22. For his shade, the lotus trees cover him, the willows of the brook surround him. 23. Behold, if the river is turbulent, he is not frightened. He is confident through Jordan rushes against his mouth. 24. Can one take him by his eyes? or pierce his nose with a snare. Behemoth and Leviathan make an appearance in Revelation 13, as they try to fight against God and can be only slain by God, Thessalonians 2.8, Revelation 19, 19, 20, both these beasts are extremely strong, unruly, and untamable in nature. In Revelation 13, 11, 12, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns, like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. 12, he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose fatal wound was healed. And that's enough Bible babble for right now. In fourth place, we have Vine, an Earl and King of Hell. This Earl commands a simple 36 legions of demons. Because I know y'all are going to make me do the math for this one, a legion is anywhere from 3,000 to 6,000 demons. So roughly between 108 to 216,000 demons. Where's my gold star for calculating that? And how are there so many demons? The significance of his name seems to be from the Latin word venea, vine, which is also the name given to an ancient war machine made of wood and covered with leather and branches used to overthrow walls. In terms of his appearance, once summoned, he will show up resembling a lion and holding a viper in his hands. Now, I don't do well with snakes. So if you request him to change said appearance, he will present in human form, with long black hair, black wings, and now holding a golden cane. I know there's people out there who might be attracted to this, present company included, but don't take that as encouragement to summon him. Known as one of the most difficult demons to summon and work with, he is also one of the only demons who can identify witches and warlocks without being previously informed about their abilities, along with having the ability to tell the past and future, which I can see is kind of tempting. Vine is insensitive to humanity and cares little for harming those who summon him, making him wildly unpredictable and dangerous to summon, along with having the power to take souls without requiring permission. I repeat, dangerous. Right in the coming in at number three, we have the unnamed angel. You know, this is typically a horror movie channel, so I decided to include an angel from the 2001 horror movie Frailty. Let me briefly explain this movie to you. So basically, the movie is about an FBI search for a serial killer who calls himself God's Hands. Spoiler alert, coming up right now. But basically, it's about Dad Meeks, father of Fenton, and Adam Meeks, who gets visited by an angel. This angel tasked him with the job to destroy demons that disguise themselves as humans, and gave him a list of these so-called demons in human form. And he goes on a massive killing spree, bringing his kids with him. He also touches the victim right before killing them because apparently that gives him visions of what crimes this demon has done. Now, Adam believes his dad, but Fenton doesn't. So what does this mystery angel do? He tells the dad some horrible things about Fenton. The dad listens to the angel and digs a hole, turns it into a cellar, and then locks his son down there for days, starving him. The movie goes on and on and more dark things happen, but basically this angel caused a serial killer to be born and is responsible for a number of deaths. Not to mention the death of Dad Meeks in the end. Again, spoiler alert. So do you really want to summon someone like that? I wouldn't want to. Even if they were demon hunting, I'm sorry. No. Coming in at number two, we have Samael. Samael is an archangel of death. His name literally means the venom of God. 
the poison of God or blindness of God. So Samael kills under God's order. When it's time to kill, he will show up with his sword drawn. The tip of the sword contains a drop of poison, which he uses to take their lives. In Jewish lore, he is the main angel of death and the head of Satan's. In fact, in early biblical scriptures, Satan wasn't a single being. Instead, it was a broad term given to any of God's opponents. Eventually, it merged and became synonymous with Samael. In fact, some people called him the alter ego of Satan. In Jewish lore, he is also said to be the serpent in the Garden of Eden that tempted Eve to sin. In Hebrew lore, he is the prince of demons and is the executioner of death sentences handed out by God. He is also called the seducer. Why? Well, he is known to seduce people into acts of evil. He seduces them so they will sin. He is testing humanity, drawing out the sinful so that God can judge them. So I'm thinking that if you summon him, the whole time he's gonna be pointing out your flaws and he'll make you sin. And then be like, look God, we got another sinner. And then you'll be another one of his victims. And he'll be like, hey look, you're the one that summoned me. I was just doing my job testing humanity. You failed. So yeah, that's just gonna end badly. So let's not. And in our number one spot, we have Lucifer. Okay, I had to include him on the list because he is a fallen angel. This is based on the book of Isaiah in the Bible. In fact, in it, it says, and I quote, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? So apparently, Lucifer was so obsessed with his own beauty and intelligence that he decided to stage an uprising against God. In the end, this led to him getting banished to the depths of hell, along with other sinners. I mean, do I really even have to go on and talk about why Lucifer is terrifying? He's got armies of demons and is one cunning and evil being. There are so many stories about people summoning him and then just everything going wrong. Let's talk about the story about John. John and his friends decided one night to try and summon Satan. They followed some ritual they saw on Reddit and began chanting and doing everything and things turned south quickly. One of his friends suffered from a seizure and started foaming at the mouth. While this was happening, one of their candles that was way across the room fell over by itself and lit a blanket on fire. His whole basement was quickly engulfed in flames and destroyed. He believes that all of this happened because he made contact with Lucifer, or one of his demon servants. There's also a number of stories of people selling their soul to the devil or making a deal with him. And again, that usually ends badly. So maybe don't go around summoning him. Please and thank you. Coming in at number five, we've got Puriel. Not to be confused with the top tier hand sanitizer, although I wouldn't be too mad if you made that mistake. This angel does a similar job to the alcohol based cleaning solution. He purifies and eliminates all sorts of unsavory things. Whether or not that's 99%, I can't be sure, but here we are anyway. His job is one that not many would really want to do. Puriel is the angel of punishment. One would think that once you made it to heaven, there wouldn't really be a need for that kind of thing, but apparently we're wrong. He watches over the prison in heaven, acting as the warden. Who knew? He's also responsible for examining each and every soul that makes it up to heaven after dying. During this spot check, he makes sure that the soul is pure enough to be allowed to pass through. Kind of like a TSA check at the airport, but somehow more invasive. Instead of checking your passport and your luggage and making assumptions based on your appearance and background, they're instead reaching into the depths of your soul. Talk about a cavity search, am I right? If you are fit to enter heaven, he will let you pass, although I'm not so sure you'll be the same person after an experience like that. Fail the test, and out you go. Down to hell, or possibly purgatory, to cavort with all sorts of other unworthy individuals. Damn, so close, too. Puriel is known for being fiery and pitiless, too, so don't count on just barely squeezing by. If he doesn't like what he sees, he's gonna drop you from the clouds faster than you can say bless you. Dang. Maybe he does have a lot in common with Purell. I'm sure he eliminates 99% of potential heavenly residents. I wonder if that could have any long-term implications like hand sanitizer and antibiotics do. You know, by leaving some of the stronger, unsavory bits untouched, that they get stronger and no longer be purified by that regular dose. Super bacteria, here we come. Oh man, did I just compare me and the others unworthy of heaven to bacteria? Gotta work on that self-esteem. Coming at number four, we've got Simkiel. Dangerously close to Sin Kiel, 
This is another remorseless, unrepentant angel. Do not put yourself in her sights lest you be utterly annihilated in seconds flat. One has to wonder how an angel becomes the chief of destruction, although I wouldn't recommend asking Simkiel anything about it. She's likely to just cash in on that title in the wildest way possible. Destruction. In addition to her first title, she also is known as the Angel of Vengeance, which works well with those predetermined traits. Destructive and vengeful seem to go hand in hand quite well. Claim revenge through destruction, destroy upon the path of vengeance. What an angel. Simkiel does spend a good amount of time in heaven, commanding other angels, but will often be called down to earth to chastise and purify sinners. Most folks have a hard enough time being chastised by their teachers and employers. Imagine a literal angel from heaven dropping in to give you an earful. My word. Plus, the way most angels purify sinners isn't pleasant. It's not just radiant light zapping you to righteousness in the same way a UV light might disinfect buffet food. You're probably getting smoten. Straight the hell with your sinful ass. She doesn't always work alone either. Many lesser angels receive Simkiel's orders and follow them with fervor. A whole platoon of vengeful, destructive angels on the lookout for sinners and sinner adjacents. I don't know about you folks watching at home, but I don't think too many righteous and pious people are watching top 5 scary videos. So Simkiel should be on our list of folks to avoid at all costs. As if we could even avoid her in the first place. Oh well, I guess there's only so much you can control in life. Might as well get cleansed by the good guys in the end, right? Middle of the pack. In third place, we have Pazuzu. If your first response was to say bless you, we have the same sense of humor. You may be familiar with references made to him in The Exorcist and the House of Ashes video game, but we're not talking about Linda Blair's acting today. As an apotropaic entity, he was considered both a destructive and dangerous wind, but also a repellent to other demons, one who might safeguard the home from their influence if he was in the right mood. Remember, if he was in the right mood, Kinda like me sometimes. He is quoted as introducing himself by stating, I am Pazuzu, son of Anubu, king of the evil Lilu demons. I was enraged in violent motion against the strong mountains and ascended them. Lilu demons are the class to which Pazuzu and his leagues of demons belong. There is also a notable connection to the earlier Babylonian personifications of the four winds. These beings, as depicted on several cylinder seals, have wings and each represents a different direction of the north, south, east, and west winds. It's important to note that Noted professor of ancient studies, Franz Wigerman calls attention to the crooked positioning of the masculine west wind in seals. Franz Wigerman calls attention to the crooked positioning of the masculine west wind in seals, which is similar to the posture in Pazuzu's physical depiction. More connections appear in later seals, as this same bent over figure takes on talons and a scorpion's tail. The main difference in their depictions is the head, and the conclusion was made that it is Pazuzu's body and not his head that denotes him as a wind demon. Another scholar, Scott Neweagle, asserts that Pazuzu's possession of four wings links to the term kipatu, meaning circle, loop, circumference, and totality, suggesting his control over all cardinal directions of wind was inherited from his predecessors. Pazuzu was often depicted with a man's body, the head of a lion or a dog, talons for feet, two pairs of wings, a scorpion's tail, and a serpentine phallus. Around now, you might be thinking, Pazuzu is a long name. He has to have some sort of a, you know, nickname or other moniker, right? Sure. He's been called the agony of mankind, suffering of mankind, or disease of mankind. Take your pick. This god of wind and plague is known as Lucifer's right hand man and has the power to control and rule over other evil spirits, being known to bring forth droughts and famine. It is said that he conspired with Lucifer to overthrow God and they were thrown out of heaven together. He is fond of corrupting the innocent and good, being known to offer help that appears good and benevolent, but actually requires recipients to request more of his assistance, sending them further and further into his debt sentencing them to an afterlife of eternal agony. See, reality is agony enough, so I'll pass. Our runner-up for today is Sergat, first mentioned in history in 1517, whose deceptive and cunning mind make him one of the most tricky demons you could possibly think of summoning. Due to his name, he is associated closely with Saturdays. Sure, he might be the least known demon on this list, lacking the background detail that emphasizes the other demons, but he is still very much to be feared. He is known as the one who can open all locks, which may seem a little silly on the surface level, but once summoned, he is impossible to escape or to conceal yourself from unless it's on his terms. Targets of Sir Gat are relentlessly pursued until found, and then presented with imagery until they go 
mad. He was the last demon to be summoned by known demon hunter and documentarist Pope Honorarius in his grimoire. Honorarius had thoroughly documented the strengths and weaknesses of every demon he summoned during his research into the oncoming war against demons, but had only written ability to open locks about Zergat before his untimely death, leaving history to believe Zergat was responsible for this event. Now I'm not going to spell out how to summon him, because I hope I've made it clear enough by now that I exist to discourage that kind of behavior, but I did find it kind of neat that one would need a nail from an old coffin to do so. Oh, and before I forget, Zergat is invisible when he manifests, making him easy to lose track of. And in first place, we have Beelzebub, Lord of the Flies, Lord of Dung, and God of Filth himself. He is described visually as a small and hunched over creature with red or purple skin, ram horns, a forked tongue, and a long tail along with incredibly powerful wings. Kinda sounds like a D&D character. He often prefers to appear as a fly when summoned, which may sound innocent until you consult history. Flies were believed to have been born from rotting flesh and uh, plagues. According to Christian beliefs, he began his career as a false god, convincing men to worship him and trick them, so he could give faulty advice that would harm instead of helping those in need. Before in the comments asks for a bible citation, since I haven't been including them for all of the listings today, I'll mention it now. In Mark 3.22, the scribes accused Jesus Christ of driving out demons by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of demons. The name also appears in the expanded version in Matthew 12.24, 27, and Luke 11, 15, 18, 19, as well as in Matthew 10, 25. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So then, they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Funny. Hanging around this spooky stuff has me quoting the Bible more than I ever thought I would in my lifetime. Guess I should have paid more attention to my middle school religion classes, or when I was altar serving as a kid, instead of just figuring out the perfect angle to tip a candle at to splash wax on my arm. What? I never said I was a normal kid. Beelzebub is commonly described as placed high in Hell's hierarchy. According to the stories of the 16th century occultist Johann Weyer, Beelzebub led a successful revolt against the devil is the chief lieutenant officer of Lucifer, the emperor of hell, and presides over the order of the fly. And I thought I was a workaholic. The 17th century exorcist Sebastien Michaelis, in his admirable history, placed Beelzebub among the three most prominent fallen angels, the other two being Lucifer and Leviathan. John Milton, in his epic poem, Paradise Lost, published in 1667, identified the unholy trinity of Beelzebub, Lucifer, and Aseroth, with Beelzebub as the second ranking of the many fallen angels, a quote from him claiming, Satan except none high or sad. In simple English, only second place is Satan here. His specialty is in tormenting mankind, causing wars, instigating murders, and known for his ability to place humans under the spell of other demons upon request. One thing historians haven't been able to settle on is which major sin he represents, with some claiming pride, others gluttony, but also some claim idolatry. Personally, since he allegedly originated from being a false god, I'm going to side with idolatry. But let me know in the comments which one you believe. Coming in at number five, we've got Astaroth. You feeling lazy lately? After a good year or so indoors, followed by some intense socialization, you probably feel like it's time to hibernate again. Fall is rapidly approaching, and with it the desire to drink hot tea and never leave the house. There are horror movies to be watched and fall recipes to be cooked. But be careful, if you use all of this as an excuse, you might be under the influence of Astaroth. Riding around on the back of a dragon and carrying a staff that sort of looks like a snake, this dude is all about laziness. Astaroth's whole deal is tempting mortals into being lazy. Once he gets them there, it's so much easier to manipulate them into bad behavior. More souls for hell, more blood for the blood god, and all that good stuff. Sounds like fun, right? That's not all he does though, although that is a pretty rough task. People are naturally inclined to laziness anyway, so being tempted into that kind of thing is the worst. In addition to that though, he's also the treasurer of hell, and helps the new demons get a hang of things when they first show up, showing them the super hot ropes and whatnot. Interesting that Hell has a currency that they needed organized, eh? I'm sure he does plenty of laundering across all sorts of seedy underworld activities. Interestingly enough, witches see Astaroth a little differently. They consider him a female demon with expertise in all sorts of areas, more specifically, lust, protection, and love. 
So Astaroth can be many things, but one thing is for sure, and that is Astaroth's terrible breath. That's a fun little demonic detail. In Christian lore, it appears that Astaroth also has dominion over math, and can make people invisible in their search for treasure. So uh, Nathan Drake and Indiana Jones may have something to talk to this demon about. And like most demons of higher orders, Astaroth can answer any questions asked as long as they fall under the topics he knows about. Coming in at number 4, we've got Olivier. A real jerk, this one. We can see this playing out across all cultures and eras, and it's always justified by some ridiculous standard. Cruelty and hatred towards the poor and disenfranchised. More than ever, the line between stable and in the street is thin and blurry, and Olivier takes full advantage of this. I'm sure all sorts of entrepreneurs, influencers, and money hoarders have been visited by this demon. Olivier, baby, the so-called Prince of Archangels down in the depths, and patron demon of encouraging malice and viciousness towards the poor. That is indeed a low, low demon to be. We live in a messed up world already, why should the poor be reviled for simply being poor? At what point do we decide that work is the ultimate good and that nothing else can stand in for that morally or economically? It seems as though the folks who do the most important, most real work, say building the structures that we inhabit or bringing food to the masses, get the short end of the stick. And Olivier apparently has a fair share in keeping that the way things are. Middle managers and corporate drones keep their specific machines chugging and then dump on the poor, telling them that they should simply work harder. Forget Astaroth making folks lazy, making folks think that others are lazy for not making as much money as them is really wild. Olivier, you really are a rat, aren't you? Coming in number three, we've got NCL. Working closely with Simkiel, NCL is another tough cookie straight out of the clouds. With an A meaning the constrainer, one can assume that nothing good comes from being constrained. Images of prison, the inability to move, and possibly even Stockholm Syndrome are evoked, are they not? All that being said, it's tough to think that an angel who makes regular use of constraints is anyone's safe haven. Unless you're a regular on a smutty roleplay blog, and in that case, you do you. NCL isn't all that bad though. He's often invoked to prevent forgetfulness and stupidity, which, to be honest, we could all use a hand with from time to time. However, if someone were to rely on angelic intervention regularly to keep them in line, well, what hope did they even have in the first place? Apparently, NCL is known for having a very short temper when it comes to these two traits, however, so those who need his help the most are likely to be held in contempt by him. Maybe find a new job, right? Humorless and hard to get along with, NCL is an excellent soldier. In fact, he's one of Michael's greatest warriors, which means if anyone is ever to step to him, things will end very badly for them. Watch out and try to keep tabs and stuff you're supposed to remember. If you fail at this, you could find yourself restrained, constrained, and in NCL's bad books. Coming at number two, we've got Gabriel. Now we're talking about the big ones, the Archangels. Gabriel in particular can be a real pain to deal with. The youngest of the Archangels, he is known as the Messenger of God. He heralds major changes and brings news from the heavens. So if you run into Gabriel, you can be assured that something monumental is about to happen. You'd better listen closely though, because he doesn't suffer fools. In fact, if he senses that you're not paying close enough attention, he might just silence you forever. That's almost what happened to Zechariah. When Gabriel descended to announce the birth of John the Baptist, Zechariah initially reacted poorly. Seeing this, Gabriel got angry. So angry that he threatened to take away Zechariah's voice. He said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and bring this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, you will become mute, unable to speak until the day these things occur. Man. I can only imagine what happens when he gets into an actual argument with someone. For a being with divine powers, he sure has a short temper. Plus, as God's messenger, Gabriel is going to be the first to show up if God ever decides to call this all quits. It's more likely than you think, too. Humans are sinful and often turn to other forces these days. And in so many movies, Gabriel is the big bad guy who causes all sorts of problems for humanity. When you're the first angel to show up, you'd better believe you're going to catch a lot of folks off guard. And finally, at number one, we've got Michael. To cap off our list, the head archangel himself. He's the one powerful enough to push Lucifer out of heaven. He's the one strong enough to end the angelic war. He's the one righteous enough to prevent Samael from tearing a baby from its mother's womb. Nothing can stop Michael save for God himself, so why would he be on this list? Well, that kind of unchecked power can never be good, now can it? As the most powerful angel in creation, he has control over all of the other angels. God leaves him in his stead to rule over the kingdom of heaven. And if Michael were to ever change things up, it's unlikely that anyone would be able to do anything about it. If Michael looks down and deems our world unworthy, we're done for. 
Game over. The book of Revelation will come to fruition and all mortals will suffer before being cleansed from the earth. It's good to know, right? Coming in at number five, we've got Asmodeus. A lot of folks take great issue with some of those classic vices. You know the ones, sex, rock and roll, all plenty of fun, all the bane of Puritans and teetotalers across the globe. If you delve too deeply into any of the above, you could find yourself receiving plenty of disapproving looks. Too bad, considering how much folks tend to enjoy these things. Is it possible to have too much of a good thing? Hard to say, especially these days. Who knows when the good won't be available anymore. However, traditionally folks have looked down upon those consumed by lust, whether it be carnal, money focused, or otherwise. Thankfully, you can blame a demon for all those urges. Isn't life funny that way? Who made up morality anyways? Why not just explain it all away by saying it's totally out of your control? Beautiful, it makes up for everything. So we've got Asmodeus, the supposed son of Adam, once an angel of harlotry. Of course, his angelic properties aren't really around anymore as he fell from heaven and now lives as a demon in the underworld. With time, he became more well known for stuff like gambling and lust, and somehow became Lilith's husband, which is fun. The two of them, both labeled temptresses, produced all sorts of demonic babies to keep the fire of hell hot. There's also the famous story of Asmodeus killing seven husbands in a row to keep one woman from consummating her marriage. Like every time she got married, Asmodeus would show up and murk her husband before they could do the deed. But then she'd go out and get married again. At some point you think she'd learn and see a pattern and stop feeding her suitors to a demon, but hey, maybe she liked the demonic attention. Asmodeus is pretty wicked looking too. Rocking three hideous heads, this demon gets around by riding a dragon. This isn't his only look though, as he can appear as a few other forms to appeal to different types of people. I mentioned gambling before, and anyone with that kind of habit can thank Asmodeus for it. Gotta love it. Lastly, his powers do tend to get stronger in November, so once Halloween wraps up, be on the lookout. Lust might not stick around as easily once everyone puts away their sexy costumes, but hey. Coming at number four, we've got Abbas Athibu. Rocking with another fallen angel here, we've got Abbas Athibu. A little tougher to say and spell, but just as scary and powerful. Raunchy as all hell, too. See, Abbas Athibu left heaven at the same time as the devil himself and didn't take the fall that well. He used to be a flatterer of God, but once he took that trip to the down below, things got ugly. If you're familiar with the most legendary gaming villain of all time, you'll see some inspiration here. While falling, Abbas Athibu was used as a life raft of sorts by other fallen angels. They grabbed at his body and managed to take hold of one of his wings. This led to the feathered appendage being torn off, leaving our poor demon to be with only one wing. Eventually, it did sort of grow back, but not as it was. Mm -mm. Abbas Thibu is known for having a red, grotesque wing. That's how many recognize this demon. Badass, but probably really upsetting to deal with after many lifetimes of perfect angelic wings. Like I said, once he made it to hell, things went extra south. He rules over Tartarus, which is essentially hell jail. All of the worst of the worst reside here, suffering eternal torment in a cage of their own creation. How lovely. Abbas Athibu also has quite the command of sorcery, able to cast powerful spells and persuade influential figures to act in unholy ways. For these reasons and more, it was decided that this demon could no longer have sway over humanity. Abbas Athibu was eventually trapped in a pillar of air, meant to be trapped for eternity. Tough break for sure. However, many do believe that Abbas Athibu will return one day and bring with him thousands of years of fury after being trapped so long. His red wing will unfurl and he will return to his vengeful and cruel ways. Who's excited? Coming in at number three, we've got our Dramalek. So we talked about Beelzebub last time and his tendency to bring about terrible things. There's plenty of responsibility that comes with being Lord of the Flies and he's gotta have some help from time to time. Unfortunately, there aren't any temp agencies or internship programs in hell. Most folks are just destined to do their jobs and do them for all of time. This is where a Dramalek comes in. This demon does his best to give Beelzebub a hand by assisting the Lord of the Flies as a great minister and chancellor, a lofty title for such an interesting demon. On top of being this assistant in Hell's hierarchy, Adramalek was also known for being a sun god who demanded human sacrifice. So even before being adopted by those beneath the surface, he was causing trouble. I wonder how many humans were dropped in his name. And I wonder how many of them ended up in Hell, possibly even under his command. Makes you think now, doesn't it? There might be a moon god brother out there demanding similar bloodshed, but I can't make any guarantees. Lastly, before I go, I'll bring up a point I mentioned in another video. Adramalek has quite the eye for fashion and quite possibly a taste for Prada. You see, the devil relies upon this particular demon for all of his wardrobe needs. That's right, 
Adramalek is in charge of the clothes the devil wears. You'd think that down in hell it wouldn't matter all that much, but vanity is a sin, so that fits right in. Coming in number two, we've got Vereen. Oh, this is a nasty one. Patience is a virtue indeed, and it is so easy to lose it. Plus, once patience is off the table, everything just gets so much worse. Sure, some can sit back, relax, and wait, but there are so many forces acting against you at all times. Who wants to wait, right? Especially in this era of constant and instant gratification. Why sit quietly and be ready for whatever when you can do a nosedive into your phone and drown in all of the readily available content? Hell, I bet a lot of you folks watching right now should be doing something else, or at least preparing to do something. Vereen is the demon of impatience and loves to push humans towards acting impatiently. He does it without delay too, no waiting in line, no queuing up, no sitting about until something good happens. So all the folks in your life who seem to act impatiently are probably being influenced by this demon. The dude in the beat up Corolla who doesn't seem to know what a zipper merge is and decides to rush all the way to the end of the disappearing lane to just nose his way in. Vereen. The lady at the supermarket who absolutely can't believe all of these selfish people with full carts in front of her line unbelievable despite her equally full cart. Vereen. Those folks who pre-order every gosh darn pop culture artifact they think is cool and then whine until it finally arrives in the mail. Vereen. Impatience will end us all, especially if we give into it. Most things will come with time, but if you try too hard to speed up the process, you're just asking for heightened blood pressure and a desire to lash out at all those around you and that's no fun. Some actually describe Vereen as a female demon too, so if you subscribe to that belief, ignore what I said before while referring to this entity as male. Interestingly enough, this impatient demon is mostly aligned with creation rather than destruction, which is a strange thing for a demon to do, but hey, I'm not going to claim to understand the whims and goals of each and every underworld entity. One last little tidbit before we move on to our final demon of the day, Vereen was supposedly involved in a pretty large-scale possession way back in the 17th century. Yep, it possessed a whole swath of nuns, which had plenty of implications for the church and those who followed it. Fun, right? And finally, at number one, we've got Louvart. Supposedly the only fallen angel amidst the demonic hierarchy, Louvart is often referred to as the Prince of Angels. High praise for someone so low. This demon is many things, but one that appears quite often is the idea that he presides over possessions. Louvart was even blamed for the possession of Sister Madeline during the demonic attacks in 17th century France. A round of applause for Louvart, everyone. Jolly good show. Coming in at number five, we've got the Cherubim. A mainstay in the home decor of grandmothers and churchgoers everywhere, folks tend to love cherubs. They've got chubby little cheeks, lovely little wings, and a whole lot of resemblance to babies. Unlike babies though, cherubs tend not to scream and cry and crap everywhere, which might actually be part of their appeal. But these angels are not as they seem. Sure, they gained quite a bit of popularity in art that depicts them as lovable little lads and lasses, but that's not really what they're supposed to look like. A lot less people would want to hang them in their homes if they actually resembled the way they're described in some texts. So their quasi-human form is about the only part they got right. Otherwise, cherubim are jam-packed with terrible features that would probably give kids nightmares. First off, they don't have just one face, they have four. One of a human, one of a lion, one of an ox, and one of an eagle. That's a lot of freaky, freaky faces. Add in four wings and you've got a wild and crazy creature. But the basic appearance of these things is just the beginning. Those who behold the cherub might notice that it always appears as if it's on fire. You know, for reasons. And apparently they were often accompanied by another indecipherable being. A half-machine, half-creature full of whirling crystalline forms, these interlocking wheels stared down upon folks with hundreds of eyes that covered their entire bodies. Imagine that, being visited by an angel, and instead of seeing a calming, serene humanoid dressed in white, you're greeted by some awful chimeric abomination and its pet crystalline wheel. Insanity. No wonder folks who claim to have seen angels went nuts. Although I think it would be pretty wicked if grandmas started putting art up of these cherubs in their bathrooms. Coming at number four, Seraphim. Keeping with the theme of Im's for a second, now we've got another order of angels that are a whole lot freakier than we often give them credit for. Seraphim are flying serpents. What else do I need to say, honestly? I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that folks don't often associate flying snakes with angels, but here we are. These winged, wiggly forces are meant to hover above God's throne, singing about how excellent and divine and fantastic he is, which is all well and good, but just think about that for a second. Why would God, the Almighty, the creator of everything and all that is good, need a bunch of snakes to fly around literally singing his praises? It seems like they're doing their best to convince anybody who might hear of it. Who else needs a PR team running around making sure that everyone believes they're actually really good? 
Hmm. In addition to their sketchy job descriptions, they're just plain weird looking. They fly around with six wings sprouting from their backs, two for their actual airborne maneuvers, and four to cover their faces. Oh, and also their feet. Yes, these flying, praise-ridden snakes also have feet. So are they dragons, or do they just have like little feet dangling out by their tails? Unless you personally plan on meeting some angels, we may never know for sure, but that image is not a good one. In some writings on celestial hierarchy, the seraphim are described as such. The name seraphim clearly indicates their ceaseless and eternal revolution about divine principles, their heat and keenness, the exuberance of their intense perpetual tireless activity, and their elevative and energetic assimilation of those below, kindling them and firing them to their own heat, and wholly purifying them by a burning and all-consuming flame, and by the unhidden, unquenchable, changeless, radiant, and enlightening power, dispelling and destroying the shadows of darkness. So if you've ever found yourself influenced by the shadows of darkness, good luck. You know, demons tend to do their best to influence good people to do bad things, but they can, you know, usually be resisted. Angels seem to just want to destroy anything that goes against their vision of holiness. Food for thought. Coming in at number three, we've got Legion. One person can be many things, but in this case, one demon is actually many demons. And these demons were so nasty, so evil, that Jesus himself had to exorcise them. Holy smokes, right? Legion is quite popular in the pop culture pantheon, and many famous exorcisms and related events seem to use him as the prime example. With so many demons dwelling within one main demonic form, they can take over the souls of people relatively easily and with varied results. However, all of the demons that make up Legion act as a sort of hive mind. They all have the same knowledge, thoughts, and reactions to things, and if one demon from the collective experiences something, they're all aware of it. With all of that knowledge and the ability to spread out all over the place, Legion can be a terrifying adversary. And even though Jesus does manage to send Legion back to hell in the Bible, there isn't much guaranteeing that many parts of Legion can't come back. Most folks only experience Legion as individual parts, too. This is when the demon is at its weakest, as each individual piece of the whole only holds so much power. Were Legion to assemble all of the many together, we could be in trouble. Imagine all the limbs. Coming in at number two, we've got Betis. Ah, corruption. Such a classic human form of folly. We work so hard to avoid it and even do our best to prop up those who remain pure of heart and purpose, but corruption spreads pretty much no matter what. We can thank Vetus for that. Second in command to Lucifer himself, this is the demon who wants to tempt holy people away from their chosen path. Even the most pious has a chance of being drawn in by this demon. He works very hard at figuring out people's deepest desires and then encouraging them to pervert everything they believe in to achieve said goals. Oftentimes, these desires are less than socially acceptable and at worst they can be quite taboo. Does Vetus care that he's ruining lives? Probably not. He takes on different forms to be extra convincing and makes sure to really sweeten the deal whenever he can. However, there is a way you can tell if Vetus is trying to tempt you. He only speaks in rhyme. Interesting, right? Hold on, there's a form of communication that almost exclusively communicates in rhyme and tells people to act in all sorts of wild and depraved ways. Music! Pop music specifically, but hey. Do you think that Vetus is communicating with modern folks through the tunes we so often hear on the radio, telling us to consume, to cavort, to consummate? That's insidious. And finally, at number one, we've got Beelzebub. Speaking of music, how many songs explicitly reference Beelzebub? I can think of two right now, Bohemian Rhapsody and Beelzeboss. I'm sure there are plenty more, but you can drop those in the comments. As you do that, I'll continue on my way talking about this demon. Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies, the devil, but also maybe not the devil. There's so much to say about this particular demon and so little time in which to do it. I'll see what I can do with what we've got today. So the Lord of the Flies may be associated with literature read in schools these days, but back before we had a tale of British boys losing their minds on an island, that associated with insects was filthy. Ruling over flies meant you had domain over demonic excrement and rot. Not a good thing, right? Throughout history, people have blamed Beelzebub for all sorts of things. He was closely associated with the Salem witch trials and cited often when folks were put to death. Plus, years after that was called off, he was again referenced in many exorcisms, both infamous and unknown. All of this pales in comparison to his actual standing in hell, though, where he is known as the Prince of Demons, and rules over the other basement dwellers with an iron fist. His ultimate goal is to destroy the world, and it seems as though he's been planning this for ages. Tricking people into worshipping false idols, commanding other infernal beings, and sowing seeds of discontent, nobody's doing it quite like Beelzebub. 
I'd recommend learning a song, wicked enough to defeat the devil. Otherwise, you're probably ending up going down to hell with him. Number five, the behemoth. You wanted five more creatures, and I wanted an excuse to keep reading this thing. This book is terrifying. Speaking of, did you know that there's a herbivore creature plated in spikes and armor with a tail the size of an oak tree, head like a lion swallowing up rivers just roaming around back then? Yeah, apparently. The behemoth. This goliath of a beast was one of the first talked about. Not the first beast, that's a completely different thing. Also terrifying. The behemoth. God's secret weapon, and apparently the first thing he created. Hadn't made us in his image yet, so uh, this hippo tank Elder Scrolls boss was what God went with. One of the most popular and revered creatures in the Bible, quote, Behold now, behemoth, which I made with thee. He eateth grass like an ox, he moveth his tail like a cedar, his bones are as strong as pieces of brass, his bones are like bars of iron. Yeah, this is definitely a dinosaur, right? Right? Scholars seem to think that the behemoth is an aggressive exaggeration of a large hippopotamus or rhinoceros. Opening up its mouth and swallowing a river could literally mean it's just an animal thirsty. In 2003, French scientists working in Pakistan claimed to have discovered an extinct species of rhinoceros called a Baluk Ethereum, which was much larger, much scarier, and matched the physical description given in the book of Job. Yeah, that's terrifying stuff. Number four, cherubim. These cute flying baby angels we see on soap ads and bottles are a lot scarier and much more sinister than the blonde cupids we're used to seeing. The cherubs, or cherubim, are God's throne bearers and appear over 90 times in the Bible. The Hebrew text says cherubim is a celestial winged being who represents God's spirit on earth and symbolizes the worship of God. In Ezekiel, cherubim are described as angelic creatures with two sets of wings and four fingers. Faces. Lion, ox, human, and eagle. Okay, this is getting scarier and scarier. The four faces of the cherubim apparently represent the four domains of God's rule. The lion represents wild animals, man represents humanity, ox represents domestic animals, and the eagle represents birds. Aren't those all wild animals? I don't know. The cherubim appear in several texts of the Bible, including Genesis, Ezekiel, Kings, and Revelation. Yeah, so lots of people were seeing these things, and they all kind of sound somewhat the same. They all oddly say four faces, like every which way they turned, they could see a face. Some say, quote, they move quickly, using a wheel within a wheel, and their wings cover their body. Question, what's with all the wheels? People just like looking up into the sky all day must have had like severe floaters in their eyes, because a wheel and a cute baby angel thing look completely different, no? A conjoined wingspan of the four cherubim are described as forming a divine chariot, the so-called mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Two cherubim make the Ark and form a space through which Yahweh would appear in Ezekiel's visions. The status of the cherubim are a sort of vehicle for Yahweh in the book of Samuel. So in a sense, they're kind of God's messengers, you know, bringing things up and down from him and to him, including him. Gotcha, a vehicle. Yeah, a vehicle. These images are terrifying. Yeah, and that's a mothership right there. That's a mothership, okay? Coming in number three, we've got the Watchers. First of all, any organization known as the Watchers is gonna be creepy. That's just creepy names 101. Second, you know Noah's Ark? The story of God telling his chosen dude that he's gonna flood the whole world in order to hard reset all the sin that's accumulated? Well, the Watchers can essentially be blamed for all that sin. This group of angels managed to fly under God's radar for a while and made their way down to Earth. See, the Watchers saw some of the beautiful women on Earth and found themselves unable to really focus on anything else. Wanting to marry these mortals, the Watchers rebelled against the rest of Heaven and went down to Earth to have a good time. While there, they lived hedonistic, overly sexual lives and taught human secret knowledge too. It's said that the Watchers were the first to teach people about weapons, which obviously ended up in brutal violence. Also, the kids they had with human mothers turned out to be a little... Mm, abnormal. You might be conjuring up images of Greek demigods right now, but that's not the case with Christianity. Instead, these human-angel hybrids turned into 1,000-foot-tall abominations and started killing and eating people. They also forced humans into slavery in order to produce more food, which, you know, good stuff. Way to go, Watchers. Very responsible. Teaching these lower beings about weapons and makeup and then breeding them to make ungodly abominations. In the end, though, God did take revenge and lock these angels away, but damn. Not even the devil could come up with a plot to so thoroughly f everything up. Coming at number two, we've got Belial. If you're a fan of this channel, you've probably heard this name before. However, we don't usually talk about Belial in a biblical context. Now, we're talking about Basket Case, a classic. 
However, the surgically removed basket dwelling monster got his name from this horrific angel. Fitting, especially when you realize what the original Belial got up to. Created right after Lucifer, he was one of the first angels to revolt against God, and that's just the start too. Belial led an army against Michael, resulting in untold amounts of carnage. Each army took three wins, and only during the seventh battle did God intervene because he wanted to make sure that Belial lost. For an angel to revolt against the others and then do unspeakable things against the others during battle, that takes a lot of power. And lots of terrifying evil, too. Man, even the strongest from hell were once angels, eh? And coming in at number one, we've got Raphael. To round it all out, let's discuss how even the holiest of forces are capable of the absolute cruelest of acts. Like, unimaginable torture that lasts lifetimes. I guess we already knew all that thanks to Dante's Inferno, but let's take a look at a very specific, pointed act of malice for a second. Raphael. Although he's not one of the named angels in the New Testament, he has become associated with healing and stirring the pool of Bethesda. However, just because he's associated with healing doesn't mean he can't bring the pain. Known for fighting the demon Azazel, he eventually triumphed over this force of evil. So what did he do when he won? Did he banish the demon, purify its soul? Nope. He bound their hands and feet together, found a big hole in the desert full of rocks, and then cast the demon into this pit. Apparently, that demon waits there until the day of judgment when he will then subsequently be cast into a pit of fire. Holy smokes, that is a hardcore punishment. I guess the demon deserved it in some way, but geez louise, that's just gotta suck. 